The gray skies were quickly melting into a dark black, bringing alarm to the competing racers. The forecast before the 18-mile regatta race had begun indicated an incoming storm, yet many racers thought that they could outrun it. The National Weather Service office in Mobile, Alabama, near where the race was being held at Dauphin Island, noticed the storm was suspiciously intensifying as it grew closer to the bay. Meteorologist Jason Beeman was concerned the way the storm was gaining momentum rather than dying out. Quote, it was an engine, like a machine that kept running. It was feeding itself. End quote. The light storm quickly turned violent, putting hundreds of racers in some of the worst conditions possible. Boats were being slammed into the docks all around the shore. Lightning was striking and the wind was gusting at over 70 miles per hour, hurricane strength, right there in Alabama Bay. A few miles north of where the race was taking place, the Coast Guard began receiving distress calls from the racers and distraught onlookers. Commander Chris Cedarholm was beginning to get an uneasy feeling in his stomach. Quote, by the third call, it was clear something big was happening. He triggered a protocol known as Mass Rescue Operation, which summoned responses from land, air, and sea. The racers were being slammed by essentially a quick hurricane with nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. The only thing they could do at this point was to simply do everything in their power to survive the intense storm. While the boat race was over, the race to rescue the stranded sailors in the bay had just begun. I'm Bradley Hall, and you're listening to episode 13 of Beyond the Harbor. On the morning of April 25th of 2015, the seas were calm and quiet in Alabama's Mobile Bay, at least for the moment. In just a few hours, the waters would be bustling with 125 sailboats and over 470 sailors with their guests. They would be competing in the annual Dauphin Island Regatta. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, regatta just means a boat race or series of races. A little before 8 a.m., the sailors began gearing up for the race at Fairhope Yacht Club, where the race was being hosted that year. The previous night, the National Weather Service issued a warning to those in the area. Quote, a few strong to severe storms possible Saturday with the main threat of damaging winds. Just before 8 a.m., the NWS and Mobile issued another statement on the incoming storms that were possible in the afternoon. The Yacht Club briefly issued a statement canceling the race due to the threat. It was quickly reversed and the race was on. The confusion caused the start to be delayed by over an hour, which may have altered the course of this story for the worse. Again, just before launch, the NWS issued yet another storm prediction for the area. Quote, Thunderstorms will move in from the west this afternoon and across the marine area. Some of the thunderstorms may be strong to severe, with gusty winds and large hail as the primary threat. End quote. Now let's consider this for a moment. Gusty winds and large hail. Would that dissuade you from taking to the water? I have to believe it probably would have me. Or at the very least, made me weather aware while on the water. But I wasn't the one that had been gearing up for the race, prepping for months to take to the finish line either. These guys were competitors. Storms were just something they had to deal with on the regular. It was nothing new for them to take to the seas with scattered thunderstorms in the forecast. Gary Garner, who was then the Commodore for the Yacht Club, said, quote, We all knew it was a storm. It's no big deal for us to see a weather report that says scattered thunderstorms or even scattered severe thunderstorms. If you want to go race sailboats and race long distance, you're going to get into some storms, end quote. And get into some storms is exactly what was going to happen. Out of the 125 boats on the water, the weather forecast only dissuaded eight boats to withdraw from the race. For some of the other 117 boats and countless sailors, it was going to be the longest day of their life. And it was just getting started. The vessels in this race were diverse, from small catamarans to larger boats with lavish cabins below deck. The sailors' skills were all over the place as well. Some were like Ron Gaston, who had years and years of sailing experience. 
He was racing a 16-foot catamaran named the Kyla with one of his daughter's friends, Hannah Blalack, who had never stepped foot on a sailboat before. Sarah Gaston, Ron's daughter, was also racing that day with a family friend. Jim was a 74-year-old sailing veteran as well. You see, the sailors on the water that day were all over the board. But one thing they all had in common was the storm heading their way. From the most lavish cockpits to vessels with only small cell phones on board, everyone was watching the radar for the incoming storm. Though it was spring and not hurricane season, Many of the sailors have lived in the area for a long time and they were no strangers to having to plot and chart against incoming storms while on the open water. On board a 24-foot boat named the Razor, Robert Luton and his 17-year-old son Leonard and their three friends were banking on finishing the race and beating the incoming storm. They estimated their arrival at around 4.15 p.m. and should have plenty of time to return to port before the worst of it. Horns then began blasting, signaling the start of the race for the different divisions of boats. The Razor crew quickly got out front and held the lead for half an hour. They spent a year rebuilding their boat, and the rush of excitement could be seen on all of their faces as they pushed ahead. The cluster of boats raced down the bay toward the finish line, with the smaller catamarans being among the fastest. Ron and Hannah on board the Kyla were making great time, but the severe storm began looming in the distance. The pair finished the race around 2 p.m., just beating out Ron's brother, Shane Gaston. By this point, the winds had begun picking up, but the water remained relatively calm. Normally, boat crews would pull into harbor to collect their award, kick back and relax, and talk about the race with others. This time, though, with the storm on the horizon, the Gaston brothers, along with many others, decided it best to sail back to port. They made a bold assumption that they would beat the storm and make it home before it got nasty out. Now, almost 3 p.m., Ron and Hannah could see a dense wall of rain coming in from the west. The three supercells were beginning to bear down on the bay. Lightning was striking all around. The wind was propelling the sailors faster than they had sailed all day. Don't touch anything metal, Ron said to Hannah as they huddled on the catamaran's trampoline. Maybe we can outrun it. Little did he know, even the fastest sailboats in the world wouldn't have been quick enough to beat out this storm that was coming in at over 60 knots. A suspicious chill came over everyone as the air turned cold. Hannah's leg began to tremble in the wind. Suddenly, the strong wind ceased, and for a brief instant, it had calmed. The split second of calamity was interrupted by a building roar. Without warning, the sheer violence of the storm showed itself. The squall whipped at over 70 miles an hour. Boats were being tossed around the bay like clothes in a dryer. The bow of the Kyla flew up and in an instant rolled over, spilling Ron and Hannah into the water. The mast had got stuck in the mud below and snapped completely in half. Ron managed to grab a hold of Hannah, simultaneously grabbing a rope that was fixed to the boat. The extreme winds pulled the boat away, leaving Ron with a decision to make. He quickly acted and let go of the rope, sending the boat beyond sight. Luckily, they had their life vests on, but the huge waves were still threatening to drown them even above the water line. But what about the others? What about Ron's own daughter, Sarah, and her sailing partner, Jim? They had been tossed from their boat as well and were battling the waves alongside each other a few miles to the south. The Luton's boat, the Razor, flipped and slung the entire five-man crew into the bay. The Razor tossed and turned, barrel rolling, until the keel was broken clean in two, leaving the men fighting for their lives. 71-year-old Jimmy Brown was fighting with a raincoat, gasping for air, trying to break free. Robert, his son Leonard, and his friend Jacob were all okay for the moment. But Adam Clark was nowhere to be found. A few minutes of battling the huge swells, Leonard decided to take off for land and try to find them some help. Mr. Brown would soon meet the same fate as the teenager Adam. Just across the way, a 26-foot boat named Scoundrel flipped over on its side, tossing the crew into the water. The captain managed to climb aboard the vessel as it righted itself. One of the crewmates, 27-year-old Christopher Beale, was still in the water. He was clinging onto a rope for dear life. The 72-year-old captain did his best to bring him in on the line as he was getting smashed by the waves. It wasn't enough, though. The conditions were just simply too rough, 
The seas were too violent, and ultimately the swells drowned Christopher. Reality quickly set in for the U.S. Coast Guard as they sprung into action after receiving distress call after call. The calls came in from people on the water, some stranded on sandbars and other distraught onlookers who were witnessing what was taking place. Commander Cedarholm notified William Lee, a three-star admiral, of the situation that was taking place. In his over 30 years of experience, he had never seen anything like this. Another experienced veteran on the waters, captaining a 22-foot vessel named the 4G, Larry Goolsby had his boat roll over a few times, but the three-man crew managed to scramble and stay on. Just beyond the shield of the rain, they were able to make out the shape of another boat, a much larger boat. They're gonna hit us, one of the crewmates shouted right before impact. Team 4G managed to leap into the water before the vessel was smashed into pieces right before their eyes. None of them had their life vests on, and drowning was a real possibility. The quick-acting captain grabbed a rope hanging from the vessel that hit them and managed to swing himself up onto the deck. He heaved a life ring toward them, desperately trying to save them. This story goes on and on with sailors being tossed into the waters all across the bay. Almost a dozen Coast Guard vessels were able to quickly respond, even bringing along a few aircraft to help in the search efforts. After what probably seemed like a lifetime, one of the first rescues of the day was made when they were able to pull up Sarah Gaston and her sailing partner, Jim Gates. They were safe, out of harm's way. But Sarah had hypothermia and went into shock after being pulled from the water. Still, many sailors remained. The rescuers were battling the storm along with the poor visibility, searching for any sign of survivors. With the passing of each minute, the circumstances grew more dire. Team 4G managed to hang on to a single life ring treading water until they were spotted by a rescue boat. They had escaped the clutches of death that they were treading in. Now, two hours had passed while rescuers were still on the scene. A little farther into the bay, Ron and Hannah continued to hang on for dear life. He remembered that he had an out-of-service cell phone tucked into his vest for navigation. He handed it to Hannah to call 911. What's your emergency and location? I'm in Mobile Bay, Hannah said. The Bay Area? No, ma'am, I'm in the bay. I'm in the water. The dispatcher was able to get a hold of a rescue vessel, and with the help of the GPS, Hannah was able to guide them to their location. Ron and Hannah were finally safe. As the Coast Guard continued their rescue efforts, there were also several local volunteers who assisted them. One of the volunteers was Scott Godbold, aboard a 36-foot sailboat. He and his wife were watching the race, supporting their son, Matthew. They managed to rescue three sailors among the chaos. They also recovered the body of the 27-year-old who went down on the scoundrel, Christopher Beale. After dropping off the survivors at the Coast Guard station, Scott was joined by his father to continue the search. He had heard about the fate of the Razor crew. Robert and Jacob had been rescued, but he learned that Jimmy Brown and Adam Clark had not made it. But no one had heard or seen from Leonard. Scott knew Leonard and his dad personally, and he was determined to find him. Now, six hours after the storm had passed, night had now fell on the Alabama waters. The chances of finding an alive and well Leonard were rapidly deteriorating. He had not had a life vest on, though only the survivors of the Razor actually knew that. Scott trolled very carefully, listening for any sign hinting at life. A shriveled and cold teenager yelled out for help at the sign of a drifting flashlight. Is that you, Leonard? Scott said. It was in fact the 17-year-old. Somehow, some way, he had held on with everything he had. The current had swept him out to sea in his attempt to swim to land. He called out to boat after boat, losing hope of a rescue as each one passed by. He was the last survivor pulled up after the disastrous race. The teams continued searching, checking overturned vessels and the nearby waters around for any sign of life. The next day on April 26, they found the body of 72-year-old Robert Delaney, who was the captain aboard the No No Nine. They resumed the search on the 27th to no avail, but on the 28th they recovered 67-year-old William Massey, who was racing on the Dauntless. 
Three people remained missing and searchers were not about to give up. On April 30th, they found two more racers. 50-year-old Robert Thomas, who was racing aboard the No-No-9 with Robert Delaney, and the teenage friend of the crew of the Razor, Adam Clark. At 9.30 p.m., the Coast Guard suspended the search for the last missing person. 71-year-old Jimmy Brown of the Razor crew was presumed dead. His body was never recovered. All in all, 10 vessels were destroyed during the storm. 40 sailors were pulled from the water thanks to the quick rescue efforts from the Coast Guard and all the volunteers. Six people had their lives taken from them on that terrible day making it one of the worst sailing disasters in the history of the United States. Scott Godbold says the events that transpired that day never leaves him, and it never will. Hannah Blalack said, quote, For a year and a half, I cried any time it rained really hard. It seemed to harken back to the brutal storm she had spent several hours in just trying to survive. The search and the rescue was over, but the Coast Guard's investigation into the event that transpired was just getting underway. The Coast Guard released their findings on April 15th of 2019. In it, they detailed a few key notes regarding the safety to prevent further events like this from happening. Firstly, they stated that U.S. Sailing Association should amend their rules to require all racers to wear a personal flotation device during the race. The second safety recommendation concerned the VHF radios. Some of these devices were stored in cabins and the sailors were unable to hear the alerts. They want the Sailing Association to amend their rules to require the sailors to have these devices on the skipper's body by way of lanyard at all times. A final recommendation was for each boat to submit a crew list to help identify who all would be on the water that day, not just the captains. This would help in rescue efforts to have a better understanding of just how many people they would need to account for. The report goes on to criticize several other items that could have prevented this disaster. But I'm going to end it here. My hope is that if you are ever in this situation, this story has helped raise questions to make you double and triple check your safety requirements before that gun fires. This episode was written and produced by me, Bradley Hall. If you enjoyed this story as we explored the tragic story of the Dolphin Island Regatta, tell a friend about the show. My website and socials are linked in the show notes for you to leave feedback and recommendations. Full transcripts along with the source material used for this episode can be found on my website. Thanks for listening.